Well, welcome to another week's analysis behind the news. You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. I think this one explains it. If you take a look at it, its title is A Disaster in the Making. And it shows two rulers that have a great deal in common and tell more than what is given in the caption at the bottom if you really understand what's going on. One is Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. And the other one is, and I've got to read it because I have a tough time pronouncing his name, uh, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And uh, this is the ruler of Venezuela. This is the ruler of Iran. This man is well known for being a communist. Uh, this man is not well known for being a communist. Iran is a surrogate state of Russia, uh, as is Venezuela. Uh, and China. Uh, the Chinese, but particularly the Russians, are arming uh, Venezuela, sending them planes, uh, sending them uh, all sorts of armaments, etc. Uh, and when you see these two men, and I notice, by the way, they are not just shaking hands, they are clasping hands in a very uh, brotherhood type of a clasp. And so this tells you more about Iran than what your newspapers uh, normally would say about the country. And uh, I'll just leave it to you to figure out what's going on there, that maybe there's something more to Iran than what we are being told in the newspapers. Uh, interestingly enough, I saw in today's paper that uh, Israel is now backing down a little bit about thinking of uh, attacking Iran. Uh, everybody thought that this would happen after Syria was, was uh, taken out of the Ba'ath Party and put over to these jihadists and rebels. However that works to, to, to uh, make them more secure, I don't know. It wouldn't make me more secure. But anyway, that was the argument. As soon as they get rid of Assad out of Syria, then we can go into Iran because then we don't have any uh, neighboring states with Israel that are going to be a problem. Ah. But when you look at the words of Morsi in Egypt, talking about Jews being descendants of apes and that sort of thing, uh, it might tell you that maybe they have a little bit more to worry about from the south than they do from the north. So, remains to be seen. Uh, and then, of course, the way we stir things up in the Middle East, it hasn't brought much stability, has it? We helped in Libya, that helped didn't it? Uh, we helped in Yemen. That helped, didn't it? We helped in Iraq, which is now allied with Iran. That helped, didn't it? The whole war on terror in, in Afghanistan and everywhere else has not turned out very well in the geopolitical sense. Uh, for instance, now we see in the uh, USA Today paper, uh, is, Africa's, uh, is Africa Al-Qaeda's new launch pad? And it says that the, uh, I'm glad we're able to get some, uh, get some rescued, talking about those that were rescued from those oil fields by the uh, 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 um, Algerians. Of course, this is said by Panetta, who now wants our women to go into combat. This just tells us that Al-Qaeda is committed to uh, creating terror wherever they are, and we've got to fight back. Well, Al-Qaeda wasn't in Algeria and Mali and Yemen and Iraq until we started the war on terror. Now they're all over the place. It seems Iraq is everywhere you look. Uh, it's another one of those successful wars we engage in, like the war on drugs. I got rid of drugs. Uh, that sort of thing, obviously, right? But then it, it has some bullet points. Terrorists with ties to Al-Qaeda are involved in attacks on U.S. embassies in Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, Libya. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen has gone from a few hundred to several thousand, despite the threat of American drones and other things of, that, uh, in the way of being involved there. And then just it says this, yet... Just, uh, I'll, I'll continue the bullet points, Al-Qaeda uh, in the Islamic, uh, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Maghreb, was advancing on Mali's capital until French troops joined the fight. As I said, now they're in Mali. And the final bullet point, much of Somalia is in the hands of Al-Shabaab, 
the Sharia imposing ally of Al Qaeda. And then it says down here, all these places now have advanced where they for Al Qaeda when Al Qaeda didn't exist in these places before the war on terror. Yet just as Deputy National Security Advisor Bremen, uh, Obama's nominee to head the CIA, notes that Al Qaeda is weaker than ever. Golly, uh, that just doesn't make sense to me. They keep giving us these sound bites to convince us of things, but when you read the newspaper, it's completely the opposite of what they're telling us. Al Qaeda isn't weaker, it's all over the place now. And then finally, it shows a little photograph here of Al Zawahiri. It says it uh, eulogizes bin Laden, apparently, in a, uh, in a video. Well, they keep telling us that the second in command of Al Qaeda after uh, Osama bin Laden was killed was everybody but Al Zawahiri. Al Zawahiri was the second in command, the aide to Osama bin Laden. And he was trained in Russia. Tells you a lot about Al Qaeda. But now we know that Al Afghanistan is a safe place, uh, that China can now move in and invest more in Afghanistan now that we've made it safe for China to, inv uh, to invest. See, we put down the Taliban in Afghanistan, which was uh, the enemy of everybody. Uh, and they attacked everybody. Uh, it didn't matter who it was. If they were in disagreement, they just attacked you. They wanted to run Afghanistan, sort of a Afghanistan for the Afghanis sort of a campaign. Well, now that we've made it more safe, China is investing even more. Uh, not American investments. Hmm. American men and women now are doing these things, but boy, we've got to make it safe for China to go in there and invest. Another thing that I've noticed in the last week in the Chicago Tribune, the headline on the front page says, Far fewer schools may close this year. The Commission on School Closing has told Chicago public school officials that shutting a large number of schools would create too much upheaval and that it is leaning toward a recommendation for closing far fewer schools than many have feared. Sources said some district officials are now looking at the possibility of closing fewer than 50 schools, 50, because commission members have found that a higher number would be untenable. Quote, Members of the commission feel that CPS was incapable. They didn't have the capacity to close 100 plus schools, said a source involved in the discussion. So they were really thinking in terms of shutting plus or minus 100 schools down in Chicago. Now, years ago, right, and I'm not talking about the teachers or anything else, but somebody in this mix wants a plan that I was aware of when I infiltrated the uh, Marxist uh, movement in Seattle. And uh, in that Marxist movement, they had a coterie of individuals who professed to be uh, educators and, and people who wanted to do things for the children. Well, the things that they wanted to do for the children that was hidden from the general public was to ultimately uh, barrack the children during the week and only allow them at home on the weekends. In other words, they'd have one big school, they would have dormitories, and the children would be there at least Monday through Friday, 24 hours a day, and go home on the weekends. That way they could indoctrinate these children better with the socialist ideal of loving the state rather than their own parents. They didn't want that influence from the parents. This has long been the goal of socialists in the socialist movement from its onset. And um, it, it hasn't changed any. And speaking of Seattle, Seattle teachers protest exams. It seems as though uh, teachers at three Seattle schools are refusing to give students district-mandated standardized exams, one of the most dramatic moves in an escalating fight nationwide over using test scores to evaluate teachers in schools. Oh my word, we don't want to teach these poor children. We might find out what they know or what they don't know. But then, of course, it depends on who writes the tests. If I was writing the tests, 
there'd be some questions I'd like to ask whether or not these children know the answer. Uh, when somebody else is writing it, they'd like to know other questions. But at any rate, the whole movement is to keep from the parents the evaluation of the instruction their kids are receiving. And it goes right back to the socialist movement in this country back in the 1820s, 1830s, yes, that far back. Clear on up today, this movement by the socialists to get into education and start teaching our children, teaching them to love the state, teaching them to love the environment and everything else. Yes, they, the environmental movement was alive and well in the 1830s in this country. Time to look into it more on your own. Until next week, we'll see you then.